Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchunas. Eric, happy last days of summer. You're remote. I'm remote. Let's do this together one more time. Remote. <laughs> one last uh, hurrah before the cold bucket of water of return to office sets in. You've got a new team member. Who is Yes. So, believe it or not, we hired a mutual fund analyst, um, which when I posted on LinkedIn that we're looking for this, uh, this guy replied with, this is like Elon Musk looking for an internal combustible engine, engine designer. <laughs> like, what are you talking about, right? Because everybody kind of knows me as ETF and passive, and I write about Vanguard a lot. Like, why would you do this? But we noticed when we covered mutual funds and notes, because sometimes we do, the readership was really good. Uh, because a lot of terminal users are these mutual fund companies. And the sort of horse race between them, who's winning, who's leasing, really played well on the terminal. And it was a, still $26 trillion in mutual funds. And there's a lot of good active managers, even though the majority of them tend to not beat the benchmark. And so we just thought we should cover this and also add a counterweight to their team's sort of bias towards passive and ETFs. And so we hired uh, David Cohn, who joined us a couple months ago and has been um, kicking butt uh, right off the bat, um, writing a lot of notes. And uh, this this week, he had one that, that crushed it. It got the equivalent of like a um, three-run homer in, in sort of readership terms for us. Um, and so I thought we should just go with some of his interesting finds because there's been a couple notes he's written that I've just, just been really surprising to me and interesting. And I, I thought we should, you know, dive into some of those. Can't wait to explore this with uh, David Cohn, who is a mutual fund analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. This time on Trillions, five interesting finds from the mutual fund world. David, welcome to Trillions. Thank you for having me. Okay, so how do you feel about ETFs? We got to start there. I mean, they have their purpose. I'm more of an active guy, uh, so I, I like mutual funds and active ETFs. But, you know, there's a lot of areas of the market where many managers struggle. So ETFs serve uh, a great purpose in a lot of portfolios. Do mutual funds still exist? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a ton of assets. Um, you think of all the um, defined benefit plans, 401ks. There's just they're all mutual fund assets. A lot of it's still actively managed. Uh, so they still have their place. OK, so you wrote a recent note that really did crush it on the Bloomberg terminal, as Eric mentioned. Uh, and it's about QQQ, which we actually, the last episode of Trillions was all about how QQQ is this wildly successful ETF and yet makes no money for Invesco, its owner. Um, you actually almost one-upped us. What did, you, what did you discover in this note? Well, I mean, if you look at the QQQ, uh, it's beaten, you know, the major market indexes, you look at some of the other ETFs like SPY and BTI, and it's just destroyed those over the last 15 years. And it's also been destroying just about every single mutual fund. But there's been about a handful of mutual funds that have been able to outperform the QQQ uh, basically by taking more risk, whether that's concentrated bets or investing in lower quality companies. Okay, so talk to us about this mutual fund of note. Well, the, the big one is the Barron Partners Fund uh, managed by Ron and Michael Barron. This fund's been around for a while. It's actually outperformed the QQQ over 5, 10, and 15 years. Um, its 15-year annualized return is 17.8, which is pretty good. And the thing with this fund is it's extremely concentrated. It only held about 20 stocks as of uh, June 30th um, with a allocation of about 40.5% to Tesla, which is pretty huge for a mutual fund. Um, you know, none of the big companies, uh, big mutual fund families typically allow their funds to be this non-diversified. I mean, it's really kind of ridden Tesla the last few years to outperformance. Yeah, this is so interesting, Joel, because David's looking through thousands of funds. This isn't even just growth managers. This is, anybody beat the Qs. And as we said last week, the Qs can be bought for 20 basis points and now 15. There's a mini me Qs that does the same thing for 15 basis points. And think about that. One sole fund. And what did that fund do? It got crazy. I mean, we've been talking on the team lately about how in order to beat the Qs, you have to kind of forget your CFA. You have to forget everything you learned and just go wild. Um, I'd even think the Barron Fund, that the one that beat it, went even you know more wild than Kathy Wood. Because Kathy Wood, in her portfolio, she has Tesla and she loves Tesla, obviously. But when Tesla has a nice run, she'll sell it 
uh, to keep the weighting at 10% or 11%. So she's always profit taking. This guy just let it run. And so he let this one stock run that which dominated the, the portfolio and it really gave him the juice. And so he just got crazier than the cues. And I just think this is a really, uh, I don't know if ironic or a conundrum, which is that all these managers go to schools, they take all the tests, they have the numbers, and they see these highly, uh, these stocks with just really high valuations. They're expensive. And their CFA brains are like, there's no way this can keep going up. I've got to invest in something that's cheaper. And that just hasn't worked. Um, now, it's some of it, you can beat the spy that way. But the cues is like just full of momentum and just a juggernaut. I, I compare it to a locomotive train. And it's just interesting. And so I think when, when Dave wrote that note this week, that only one manager beat the mighty cues, um, I think a lot of our clients were like, yeah, I wonder who it was, because I, I know I didn't. And, uh, and so it's just interesting. And this could all change. The cues is, is a, you know, has a high valuation, right? A high P, uh, average P-E ratio. So if there's a move to value that's long term, they, these people could outperform the cues in mass. I'm not saying it can't happen, but the last 15 years, it's really just been almost impossible to beat. So, so Dave, obviously the knock on active is always that uh, you might be able to to beat something, but by the time you account for fees, maybe not so much. What what's the fees look like for the fund that's been able to crush the cues like this? There, it's not terrible. It is still a little bit higher than. I mean, obviously, it's a lot higher than the typical ETF. Um, so, an investor is basically willing to pay a fee to outperform the cues, uh, which is the case here, and you know, willing to take that risk that comes with it. I mean. You know, and this is how you can tell Dave's from the mutual fund world. Um, one point six nine percent. That's that's a little. That's a lot higher. Uh, but for, for a mutual fund, it's not that bad. It's within the range of of normalcy. But for an ETF, one point six nine would be like uh, you know a million dollars. I mean, uh, again, QQQM, which is tracks the Nasdaq one hundred, is fifteen basis points, and a lot of the you know Vanguard funds are under five. Um, it's interesting though. This fund has. Seven billion, so it clearly has gotten some interest. Seven billion is a pretty big size for an active mutual fund, and it's taken in some money, about half a billion over, uh, say, the past five years. But that's not a ton of money considering this performance. So a lot of that seven billion Joel came from just the performance. So even though this mutual fund had had such a nice run and was the only one to beat the cues, it barely got rewarded with flows. Whereas Kathy Wood, when she had her run, got rewarded big time. So. You have to wonder if Barron was in an ETF wrapper, maybe it would have gotten more attention. Um, you know, is this part of this sort of difficulty of mutual funds having to overcome their their vehicle so that even if there is one that's really dynamic, maybe some people don't even give it a look anymore? I don't know. It's just an interesting case study for a lot of reasons. Dave, when you dissected the portfolio, we talked about the concentration. What else stood out to you about how they were able to achieve this? I mean, one thing, you know, in addition to the Tesla, it's kind of funny. I noticed that they have an 8.3% allocation to SpaceX and then um, just a below 1% allocation to X holdings. So they seem to be a fan of Elon. Um, it's kind of noteworthy. Um, you know, I mean, the Tesla has really been growing the last three years or so. They've held it longer than that. But the thing that's interesting is they continue to take concentrated picks. So if you go back 10 years, it's a different company that has a huge allocation. And so they're really just making big bets on companies and, you know, keeping this really, really concentrated portfolio. They have some other stocks in here that people probably know, like Hyatt, um, MSCI, which is an index company, Vail Resorts, um, Charles Schwab, um, Factset, which is a Bloomberg competitor, but not a big weight. So those are two, three percent of the portfolio. Um, like you said, half the fund is basically Elon. I mean, they might as well call it the Elon Musk <laughs> fan club fund. <laughs> <laughs> this 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 isn't this fund doesn't have to. It's kind of a I wouldn't say go anywhere fund, but it's not you know a large cap. It it kind of can invest in um, any companies it wants, uh, basically. Um, so I think that's a, a benefit. Um, it's not really put into one little category that it must be one specific benchmark. It kind of just um, invests in what they want and it's it's worked for them so far. Interesting to get that SpaceX exposure too. Like that's not a step that we wouldn't see that in a in a ETF 
uh, easily, I don't think, Eric, right? No. I have to look at this, but I believe, and David could correct me, mutual funds can dabble in private equity a little bit. Uh, they can't go full on. I, I forget the percentage, but like there are definitely some fidelity funds that have a little bit of private equity in there, like little doses. Yeah, no, they their mutual funds can hold private companies. Just the interesting thing is every mutual fund will value this, their private companies differently. So they'll place a different value than a different than a different mutual fund will place on the same company. So it kind of is hard if you're looking at their holding to determine the exact value. Um, so you kind of just have to go with what they say. Um, but they seem to be a big fan of Elon and they're they're going with it right now. Okay, so we mentioned Fidelity briefly there. I also want to bring that in because you had some interesting uh, research about how Fidelity's active equity managers have performed. How have they been doing? Uh, they've been doing uh, pretty well. Um, I do want to mention uh, first, though, that actually over five years, there were two um, Fidelity funds that outperformed the QQQ, uh, Fidelity Series Growth Opportunity or Growth Company and Fidelity Advisor Growth Opportunities. Um, and so those those two funds were able to outperform over five years. But if you're looking at all Fidelity's active equity managers, um, we did a study and it looked like about uh, approximately 50% have outperformed their benchmarks. And that's taken into account sector funds against their primary benchmarks, which are which is the S&P 500. Uh, but then actually when you remove the sector funds, their active managers do even better. Um, and so they're they're doing pretty well for themselves. And, you know, it's a big company and, uh, you know, they've got a great program where they train analysts from the ground up that eventually become their PMs. And so a lot of them are doing well. And one thing I did notice with a lot of the growth stocks, they had a lot of exposure to NVIDIA. And in fact, I think they were the third largest holder of NVIDIA, which is I covered in a different note, which has really driven a lot of their gains this year. Again, latching on to a juggernaut stock seems to be key for PMs, at least in this era, versus finding like a value play. Um, yeah, you're right. They're the third biggest holder after Vanguard and BlackRock um, and bigger than State Street. So they definitely overweight. The other thing about Fidelity that's interesting, obviously, they have this famous name for active, but they haven't done a ton in the ETF world. And you know, they're active mutual funds. Some see inflows, some see outflows. But where they get most of their flows these days in, is in their index mutual funds which now have over a trillion dollars, Joel. If Fidelity converted all of its index mutual funds into ETFs, they'd be bigger than State Street in terms of assets. So they have a lot going on. Uh, they're just, they're a private company. You don't hear a ton about them anymore. Um, but I think we're going to hear big things. Uh, I think they're going to try to take some of what David found, these, these managers who are bucking the trend. If you have over half being their benchmarks, that's way better than the averages because the average is about a third. They're probably going to try to figure out how to move that that brain power and that IP into the ETF wrapper. I think we're going to see that happen over the next 10 years um, from Fidelity and many other companies. But Fidelity, with that track record, it should help them a lot. I think their price point, how they where, where they put the expense ratio will matter. But overall, if you can perform that consistently, you're, you're going to get looks. Okay, so the irony here is... Obviously, you've written a book about Jack Bogle and what Jack Bogle did at Vanguard. Uh, Fidelity, not known for indexes or anything touching passive. So so what, what stands out to you, Eric, about how Fidelity has found some success here? I mean, honestly, Bogle relished this. He, he loved Fidelity used to basically, you know, dump on passive back in the day. It, I think I think they're the ones who said, would you, would you pay for an average surgeon if you were having heart surgery? <laughs> you know, an index is like average. And there was a lot of pushback on what Bogle was doing back in the day. But Fidelity kind of came around. To their credit, they swallowed their pride and launched a series of low-cost index funds. And now when Fidelity puts out a press release, they say, every single one of our index funds is cheaper than the Vanguard equivalent. And they are. A lot of them are zero to one to two basis points. But Bogle loved this. Because he wanted to change the whole game, not just have Vanguard get successful. So he would be happy that Fidelity is seeing so much success in the low-cost index funds that they put out. But I think what, what blows me away is that trillion dollars. That is a ton of money that no one talks about because it's in the mutual fund wrapper. Uh, again, if Fidelity was an ETF, uh, if, if all those index mutual funds were ETFs, Fidelity would be the talk of the town. David, speaking of fees, um, one other note you did that we sort of collaborated on to a degree was you looked at flows into mutual funds based on expense ratio buckets. 
just to see if there was a connection between that. Because, you know, what's more important now if you're active, your performance or your fee? And just tell me what you found when you looked at that. So I separated um, mutual funds into three fee buckets, under 40 basis points, between 40 and 80 basis points and over 80 basis points. And similar to findings that Eric and the rest of um, our team have found on the ETF side, if you look at mutual funds under 40 basis points, they're seeing better flows than the rest of um, you know, than the rest of their counterparts or peers. So on the equity side, it's more of less outflows. Um, so new equity mutual funds are still seeing significant outflows. But once you drop down to below 40 basis points, the outflows is considerably less than the other two buckets. On the fixed income side, it was actually seeing a lot more inflows. So fixed income mutual funds with low, uh, with uh, under 40 basis points uh, are seeing a ton of flows compared. But once you go over uh, 40 or even over 80, it, it's disastrous on both the equity and the, um, the fixed income side. And so this completely is in tune, Joel, with what we've done on the ETF side research-wise. Active ETFs are finally having their day. It took them 10 years, but it wasn't until they got cheap. And 40 basis points appears to be some kind of a magic number for advisors because 95% of the flows into active ETFs, which are massive these days, is into ETFs under 40 BIPs that are active. It's only, and they only make up 25% of the products. So think about that. That's punching way above its weight. It's very clear. My theory on all this, and we, we've we gone, I thought about this heavily, and it's kind of our E equals MC squared, is you have to now beta adjust your fees if you're active. So what do I mean by that? Beta, which is just owning the whole market like in an index fund, is free. So if you own a lot of beta, like I'm talking Apple, Microsoft, if that's the top of your portfolio and you're beta heavy, you have to lower your fee because an advisor is like, well, I can get most of that for free now. Why am I going to pay you 1%? So as you have a fund, a manager that's close to the index, if they come down in fee and that way they sort of beta adjust their fees, I think that an advisor is like, well, okay, you're just charging me for the active. And that's why we say you have to be either cheap or shiny if you're active. If you want to charge 70, 100 basis points, you got to be Baron Funds or ARC. you got to go hog wild and swing for the fences like Babe Ruth. And there, because there you can actually double or triple the S&P and not just beat it by 2 3%. But if you're one of these managers looking for a little bit of excess return beyond the benchmark, I just think that beta being free is such a massive innovation that Bogle and Vanguard brought along over the last 40 years. You have to adjust to that. And I think the mutual funds show it and the ETFs really show it. Okay, Dave, you got a, another note where you looked at fact, a factor, particularly quality and, and the stock picking um, in small caps. What'd you, what'd you learn there? Uh, well, it's actually interesting because a lot of the funds I noticed that did outperform the QQQ, they took on a lot more risk. Uh, but this is actually on the opposite side. This is a, um, as you know, most uh, small caps are underperforming uh, large caps for a big part of the year. And but this fund, it's the KAR small cap fund. They have a quality uh, factor type approach where they're looking for really quality type companies. Um, and so they've been able to do that, keep their risk down and outperform. But one thing I do want to mention about this fund, like Barron's, it's a concentrated fund. It just instead of the high flyers, this is much more of a, you know, better or companies that would be considered part of the quality factor, uh, great balance sheets, you know, just really good companies, but they're basically making massive bets on a few companies. I'm sensing a theme here, <laughs> like concentration and quality. Yeah, it's, you know, definitely um, concentration does work, but I actually wrote another note that um, not, it doesn't always work. It, it really depends on the manager. If a manager has skill and they know what they're doing and they, they really pick great stocks, concentration can do great things. But if you're just concentrating a portfolio just for the sake of it, 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 it brings on a lot of risk and a lot of loss and a lot of mutual funds of it that are just concentrated and really don't have the, the best teams are really faltering. Yeah, Joel, when, when I said earlier, you got to be cheap or shiny. If you're cheap, it's almost less performance sensitive. Like you could be a low cost stock picker who charges like DFA or Vantis or JP Morgan who charges like 25 basis points to invest in small cap value. And just the fee alone, you'll get some interest. 
But if you're high fee and high concentration, it's not enough. You then have to perform. So I think ARC is a great example. Some thematic ETFs are good examples of that. And this KAR is a good example. Also, I think that in the small cap space, that's an interesting spot for active because if you look at the number of analysts that cover like certain large cap stocks like Amazon, it's in like the 50s, right? And then you get down to small caps, some stocks aren't covered at all or barely. So there's probably more opportunity for someone to find something novel, uh, right? There's less information on all these companies that everybody knows. So I'm not totally surprised that this manager found a niche down here. But again, this is why David was hired, was to sort of dig into all these managers. Uh, again, there's almost double as many mutual funds as ETFs, you know, and to find some of the diamonds in the rough. And I think this is a good example. Speaking of diamonds in the rough and finding exotic species, this last one is a good, just a great one to end on. When David showed me this fund, I never heard of it. I was like, WTF. I can't say the whole thing. So let's give you the acronym. And I never seen anything like this. I, I'll just introduce it as that and say, David, talk to me about Fairholme. Fairholme is one of the more interesting funds I've ever seen in all the years I've covered mutual funds. Um, this fund has a, or according to our data, a 91% allocation to a real estate company called St. Joe. Um, and so this is just a, this is extreme concentration. It, it makes barren funds look like a, you know, a portfolio of 500 stocks. I mean, it's just, and, you know, I originally thought this made it not qualify as a regulated investment company, uh, just due to tax issues and, um, you know, whether they could claim that, but apparently the, there's a threshold of about 25% that you can't go above, but apparently that's during purchases. So if your purchase is under the 25% and then you let that stock grow continuously, it can go up to 90% or so. It can go up to 100% if you wanted to. It's just not very traditional, I'd say. Um, it's definitely out of the ordinary, but I mean, they posted a return of 31.3% last month, which is pretty ridiculous, um, pretty impressive. And uh, but with a fund like this, you're going to have extreme risk as well. And, you know, they're likely not going to perform like that every month. It's going to go back and forth. And I think if you own this, you really need to not pay attention to it. You, you need to kind of look <laughs> at it over the long term and kind of just let it sit there or else you're going to have a heart attack. Wait, what? what is it? What is it holding, though? It's well, the, the main stock right now is a real estate company called St. Joe that's really benefiting, um, you know, due to real estate prices in Florida. No, whoa, 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 hold on. No, no, no. Joel, this is very important. It's not just Florida, it's the panhandle, where, as you know, my dad <laughs> lives and I visit all the time and tell you I'm going to live someday because it's so beautiful. Emerald green water, white sands that are so fine to the foot, it's clean, uh, there's no taxes. And so, this manager. It's almost as if he used this stock to buy a bunch of land in a place in America he thinks is going to go up because even the manager's like, I want to move there and drive a golf cart around every day. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy has the same life vision as me. So I, I can relate to this. Is a, this is just this amazing long, long game trade to own land in Florida through a mutual fund that owns one stock. It's just so bizarre. We've gone almost five years or so without Eric talking his book. And then he finally broke down and, and <laughs> talked his book. So Joel, while the Fairholme Fund, even with everything we just said, it, while it did not beat the QQQ, obviously only Barron did that, it was up almost as much as the Qs over the past five years and it obviously beat the S&P by a lot. But what's interesting is if you look at this fund and its peer group, it's beat 99% of its peers pretty much five, three, one year and year to date. Um, again, it's very rare to see a fund, you know, register in the high 90s like this. So, Joel, I think the lesson here in a lot of these funds today is if you want to be at the top of the heap and be able to charge a decent fee, um, you know, as Prince says, let's go crazy. You got to get wild. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll take that. Um, uh, David, um, I got to ask if we've got this much exposure to uh, Florida Panhandle, what else does he have in the portfolio? Only a few other stocks, uh, Enterprise Products Partners, Commercial Metal Company. Um, there's actually a Fidelity uh, Treasury Fund that's also part of the portfolio. But these are all very 
Uh, he's also got treasury bills in there as well, but these are all tiny allocations. It's just really it, long it's panhandle. Saint Joe. Yeah, yeah, long panhandle. Uh, all right, uh, Dave, we got one more question for you. Uh, it's a it's a it's a great finale question. We ask many a guest on Trillions, which is, what is your favorite ETF ticker? Favorite ETF? Yeah, ticker. Oh, um, that's a good question. I know, I know. This is like I'm, <laughs> I'm bringing, I'm bringing you the heater. Um, I would just say VTI, um, because I want to grab the whole market. Yeah. All right. Just I don't bowl know of Cheerios. Sexy. Bowl of Cheerios. <laughs> yeah. All good. All good. All right, Dave. Thanks for joining us on Trillions. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you like to listen. We'd love to hear from you. We're on X. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Balchunas. Trillions is produced by Magnus Henriksen. Sage Bauman is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Bye.